We've seen where the labor supply curve comes from. Workers trade off between leisure and consumption to decide how many hours to work. What about the labor demand curve? How do firms choose how much labor to hire? Remember that with firms, we need to consider both the short run and the long run. For now, let's think about the firm's choice in the short run. In the short run, capital is fixed and labor is variable. So the firm only needs to decide how much labor to hire. To make this decision, the firm needs to look at the marginal benefit and the marginal cost of hiring one more hour of labor. In a previous lecture, we defined the marginal product of labor, or MPL, which was how much quantity increased with the addition or extra unit of labor. Could this be the marginal benefit for the firm? Not so fast. Think about two firms, one that employs carpenters who make chairs and one that employs jewelers who make diamond rings. Suppose the marginal product of the last hour of labor is one in both cases. An extra hour of work from one of the carpenters is enough to make one more chair. And an extra hour of work from one of the jewelers is enough to make one more ring. If the marginal product of labor for each firm is one, does that mean the marginal benefit of labor to the firm is the same in both cases? Of course not. The worker who spent the additional hour making one more diamond ring has made his firm a lot more money than the worker making one more chair. What the firm cares about is not the marginal product of labor, but the marginal revenue product of labor, or the additional revenue generated for the firm by the next unit of labor. The revenue a firm gets from one more good is simply the price P in a competitive market. So the marginal revenue product of labor, or MRP, is equal to the marginal product of labor, how many more goods can be produced with that extra unit of labor, times the price. This is the marginal benefit to the firm of the last unit of labor. What about the marginal cost of that last unit of labor? This is simply the wage the firm must pay the worker. As always, to maximize profit, the firm wants to set marginal benefit equal to marginal cost. So the firm chooses to hire more workers until the marginal revenue product of labor is equal to the wage. In other words, it hires until the cost of the next hour of labor is the same as the value of what that hour of labor can produce. Graphically, this will result in a downward sloping demand curve. Why? Well, because at each wage, the firm sets wage equal to the marginal revenue product of labor, which as we saw earlier is just the marginal product of labor times the price. The price of goods is constant, so that doesn't change. What changes is the marginal product of labor. As we discussed earlier, as the firm hires more and more labor, the marginal product of labor is diminishing. The first worker is really valuable. She has a high marginal product and therefore a high marginal revenue product. But as the firm hires more and more workers with capital fixed, their marginal product falls. And with a constant price, this means the marginal revenue product falls too. Remember, the firm wants to set the marginal benefit equal to the marginal cost. Marginal benefit is marginal revenue product. So if MRP is falling as the quantity of labor goes up, so must the marginal cost of labor or the wage. The labor demand curve is downward sloping. That's how firms are deciding how many people to hire in the short run when capital is fixed. What about in the long run? The analysis of labor demand in the long run is fundamentally the same as that in the short run with one big difference. In the long run, firms can also adjust capital. What difference will that make for the demand for labor? Suppose the wage goes up in the short run. In that case, the firm might not want to change its workforce much since it wants to keep producing at a certain level and it can't add more machines to help with the work. But in the long run, if wages go up, the firm might add machines to replace workers and its demand for labor will fall. So in the long run, demand for labor is more elastic than it is in the short run. This is because in the long run, there's a substitute that's available that's not available in the short run, more machines. This is an example of a general rule in economics. The more things that can adjust, the more elastic the adjustment will be. Imagine you wake up one morning and pour yourself a bowl of cereal before realizing you don't have any milk. You've never liked eating cereal dry, so you really need to get milk immediately in the short run. You don't have time to shop around, so you just walk down to the corner store and pay whatever price it's charging for the carton of milk. In this case, you won't be very price elastic. You don't have any good substitutes, so the corner store can get away with charging you a high price for the milk. After you've enjoyed your bowl of cereal with the expensive milk, you start making plans to stock up on milk to avoid this situation happening to you again in the future. You no longer need milk in the short run, but you're planning ahead for the longer run. Now you're able to shop around and compare prices. 
You could take a bike or a car to the grocery store and get a better deal. In the long run, you wouldn't be stuck paying the high price of milk at the corner store. You're more price elastic and more price sensitive in the long run. The same is true for firms and their demand for labor. In the short run, if workers want higher wages, there isn't much firms can do besides pay them more. But in the longer run, it can replace the more expensive workers with machines. It's more elastic with respect to the wage rate in the long run.